So what is it that I'm going to talk about? I am going to cover this concept on disruption. And I want to focus on where Tom ended. And Tom really spoke about this fourth industrial revolution. And Martin Luther King is famous for saying in his prison cell in Alabama that the danger with revolutions is that the majority of people sleep through revolutions. And Tom spoke about the fact that we must be very careful that we're not even at the starting line of the revolution. And so for me, the question is really around how do we participate in this revolution uh, and all of the hype and the sensation there is around robotics and AI and machine learning and all of what we see in this digital revolution that we're going into. So part of what I want to talk about is really to set some of the context. And in setting the context, it's important for me to put some elements out there. The first one is the fact that we are already in a highly disruptive digital economy with rapid sector disintermediation and with phenomenal changes that we see. And the changes that we've seen in the last five years and the changes I'm going to argue that we'll see in the next five years will see a significant change in every sector that we know and we see and understand and appreciate. For me, a massive change in terms of my, my personal life was two and a half years ago spending some time in South Africa with Sebastian Thrun, who, by the way, was the architect of the Google self-driving car that today will fundamentally change the automotive sector forever. Sebastian Thrun, a Stanford professor, was also the architect of MOOCs and created the first online massive course for open education. And so the individual is really uh, a change maker, a maverick, a revolutionary. And he said that what we learned and what we studied three years ago, not 30 years ago, is 90% irrelevant to how we're going to navigate and lead our organizations and our countries in the next five years. And for me, that really starts to speak about how do we operate in this type of shifting landscape? And if we see this revolution, how is it that we're able to participate in it? And what does this revolution mean for a continent like Africa? And part of my reflections and my musings have been really to talk about what disruption means in a contextual setting like, like Africa. And so a number of people asked me, because I didn't come from South Africa, I, I came through late last night from Harvard in Boston, and people have been asking me, are you not jet lagged? And I said, no, this day has been phenomenal because we've met mavericks. We've been exposed to mavericks that are really driving the change on the continent. And so what does that change mean for us? Let's look at this picture here, because I think it best encapsulates this disruptive economy that we're going into. What worried me when I put this up was that stat on Tinder, 972,000 Tinder swipes up or down in one internet minute. So 972,000 people saying yay or nay on Tinder every single minute. Uh, let's not even talk about Vine or any of the others, but Tinder really got my attention. Uh, I'm, I'm married with three kids, so Tinder doesn't, uh, is not important to me, but nonetheless, it was important. <laughs> it was reflective. So these swipes, as you know, if you're not familiar with Tinder uh, and you happen to be single, it's the opportunity to swipe up if you like somebody or swipe down if you don't. But 972,000 people are doing this at the same time, so hedge your bets and see where you land. <laughs> and so let's bring this together. And let's talk about why... Uh, disruption is critically important for a continent like Africa. And so for me, I want to start with this premise that innovation and disruption has to be contextually relevant. Otherwise, we get caught up in the hype, and we rarely get caught up in stuff that's irrelevant to a continent like ours. We tend to miss what disruption means in our continent. And secondly, and perhaps as importantly, Disruption and innovation has to be based on the end user. And the end user is critically important. And so to color this and to contextualize this, I'm going to ask you to do a test. And I want you to spend some time with a person or three people. So one on your right and one on your left. If you invested $1,000, and no Googling, please. If you invested $1,000 in the following stocks in January 2010, how would you rank their performance in 2017? Simply, which one would be the most valuable today from the $1,000 that you put in in 2010? Take a minute and let's do that. 
So for those of you who are on your phone, I hope you're on Tinder and not Googling the answer. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, this is not an election. It's not democracy. You have to vote. Who thinks Tesla? Pick your hand up. Right up. Okay. Who thinks Apple? Right up. Who thinks Amazon? Wow. Amazon. Who thinks Netflix? <laughs> Who thinks Domino's Pizza? Really? <laughs> Who thinks Google? So, and I hope if Fedeva and Amina, you can give us a prize because it actually is Domino's Pizza. <laughs> and so let's talk about this. And uh, let's talk about what it means. <laughs> And, uh, and let's really start to contextualize why is it that we get caught up in the hype and we get caught up in the disruption and fail to appreciate the contextual relevance of disruption. And I want to link it to our continent. And we fail to appreciate that disruption and innovation, as I said, is about the end user. What did Domino's do? Phenomenally well. They were able to take the disruptive elements and make them contextually relevant to pizza. And many examples, and there's phenomenal examples that you can pick up online. Driverless pizza. Uh, the most fascinating example for me was the example when Domino's created an app, because everybody thinks create an app and we innovative. You're not innovative by creating an app. <laughs> what Domino's did beautifully was Domino's created an app, yes, and that didn't mean that they were disruptive. They created an app with a phenomenal human interface. And what did they do? They created an interface where you were able to create your own pizza with a multitude of ingredients. And once you created an Abdullah pizza, you could put that pizza on the app and sell the pizza by telling your friends and your family, so your 31 Twitter followers, that this is my pizza. <laughs> and then every pizza that gets sold in your name, you'll get an incremental cost or profit of that. That's huge intimacy. So that's disruption, right? Contextually relevant disruption. Let's look at another example. And so everybody is really caught up in, in, in Amazon. And so I was in Silicon Valley in September with uh, some executives really talking about what disruption means from a Silicon Valley context. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. So that's what Tom spoke about. That's AI in real life that will fundamentally change the lives of many people in the retail sector, largely in developed country contexts. But what it does mean for me, and how it pains me, is that if we've got the technology of AI, of robotics, of machine learning, how do we translate that technology into emerging market economies like ours? How do we make it real and relevant? So if we're living through this period of disruption, and let's uh, take this Amazon example further. In 2006, Amazon was a 17 $0.5 billion market-valuated company. 
In 2017, it's a $500 billion company. And at the same time, companies like Sears, which were double its size 10 years ago, are now 495 times smaller than it in terms of market capitalization. So that's disruption in our lifetime. How do we make sure that we don't sleep through this disruption? And so let me bring it back and let me take it to the continent. And so for me, it comes down to this, my life, and I spend a lot of time really thinking about what's the canvas that we're painting on? What are the colors that we need? What are the skills? And who are the mavericks who are going to drive this change? And we've had the privilege of connecting some of them today. And I want to spotlight three that I've had a close, intimate relationship with some of them. Disruption deals with pain points. It addresses organizational or country pain points. And so this is a pain point, right? And the logical view and how we educate it is that if we've got this type of a context uh, and we don't have the amount of retail outlets, then let's build another mall. And we're all familiar with what Jumia has done in terms of really building this disruptive model. This is Africa's first unicorn company, and that's a tech a company with a valuation of a billion US dollars. And so, yes, it's early days, but in three to five years, I'm going to argue that this will become the new normal. We must talk about the stories of companies that are fundamentally changing this continent like Jumia. And that's important for me. In 2015, I had the privilege of leading an MBA group that I do every year at my business school, Gibbs. And I took a group of 31 MBA students to India. And one of my students was a medical doctor, Dr. Ntabi Senglekwete. And she came with me, and many students who traveled with us were from uh, large banks and large insurance companies, and they wanted to visit these companies in India. And she kept on coming to me and saying, I want to visit disruptive healthcare models in India. And part of our journey, we had the privilege of spending time with Dr. Debbie Shetty, who's known as the Henry Ford of medicine, who's revolutionized affordable healthcare. And so she then came back in October 2015, and for six months, left private practice as a medical doctor in South Africa uh, and really started to think about how do I impact the healthcare environment? What's the pain point in South Africa? Well, the pain point is that this is what healthcare looks like. It's overwhelmed, it's overburdened. 83% of South Africans are dependent on public healthcare and only 17% have access to private healthcare. And so as a consequence of 83% of people dependent on public health care, the state burden of health care has become complicated and complex. And so part of that is we see long lines. And so she spent some time in a community called Dipsluit, which is 16 kilometers from Santon, which, as you know, is one of the wealthiest parts of this continent. And so she went to Dipsluit and really started to understand the socioeconomic dynamics of that community. 750,000 people the nearest public hospital, 46 kilometers away. And so people would take an entire day of work and go to the nearest public hospital on public transport, get there and wait in lines like this here, and possibly not get to the front. The employers are disconnected from their world, and so when they ask for a day of leave just to access basic health care, they were denied that. And so what happens? What happens is that you defer health care. And when that happens for 750,000 people, then the bigger causal impact is that healthcare conditions deteriorate as a result of that. And so she then said, can I set up a low-cost healthcare facility in Dipsluit? And she knocked many funders, and everybody said, no, there isn't funding available because people in these communities don't have the finances to be able to pay for low-cost healthcare because that's the mindset. That's the unconscious bias. That's how we think of the context of others, and that's not the way we should. And so what does she do? In May 2016, she self-funds her first facility in Dipsluit. And sh this is what it looks like. She pivots it on four strategy areas. Quality. You can walk into any of her quality health facilities anytime when she opens from 8 to 8, 365 days a year and get a phenomenal world-class facility. Affordability. She charges the equivalent of 18 US dollars for your entire medical checkup, including all of your medication, uh, and the equivalent of that in a private healthcare facility would be upwards of 50 US dollars. Convenience. She opens, as I said, 365 days a year, 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 p.m. at night. 
and she uses technology to understand the data, the patterns of behavior. To cut a long story short, what she's managed to do in a short space of 18 months is she now sees 15,000 patients a month in four facilities across Johannesburg, and she'll soon open a facility every month. And she's proof concept, and now funders are there <laughs> wanting to know what are you doing. What I find incredibly heartening for people like Dr. Ntabi Senglechwete is these are the mavericks who are fundamentally using disruption to transform our societies, to bring dignity to the lives of our people, and to really change the narrative by saying if there are elements of disruption, how do we use them to address pain points in organizations and societies that we live in, to create affordable healthcare? And what she's managed to do through the pivot of technology and because of a model that she's built is that the average waiting time from the time you walk into the facility till the time you leave is 27 minutes. Try and get that anywhere in the world in any general practitioner and you won't. And the most heartening thing for me is that she brings in affordability and convenience. You go to the facility, if you're not healthy in the next seven days, you come back for a free checkup. You get a call the next day to ask you what your service was like and how people assisted you. And the best part of this year is that the majority of the people or the third most wanted request in the facility is for medical sonas, for pregnant ladies who come there so that they can see their babies. And so in connecting with them, the question is often, why is this life-changing? It's life-changing because the cost of that sona in a private healthcare facility is upwards of $150. For $18 now, I can at 7 p.m. at night after work come and spend some time uh, to see my, my baby, a girl or boy. And that's life-changing. And so, for me, the, the question that, that I want to leave is, yes, we've got disruption. And yes, the world is fundamentally shifting. But where are the mavericks? Where are the mavericks that are changing this continent? Where are the mavericks that really start to transform the societies that we're in? Disruption is not about technology. It's not about the digital economy. It's the fusing of social scientists and digital scientists. It's the fact that many of us are caught up in the digital elements, but it's the social scientists that will change society and that picture best encapsulates it. How do we get these social scientists? How do we get people to come together and connect around the social scientists and the pain points that we have in society? Secondly, how do we <laughs> equip our people? <laughs> How do we equip our people to get the, the skills, our societies, to get the type of knowledge and expertise to be able to participate in this economy? Because when we talk about leapfrogging, it means that we passed the starting line. It means that we've got all of the tools to be able to not start at the starting line, but be a few steps ahead. Because we're not going to be left out of this revolution, arguably. And we've got to create the skills. And so my last point that I want to do end with is to say that I run an, uh, a youth organization called The Collective Genius. And part of that is really seeing how do we change the education landscape. And we've started, and I've become very particular about what we teach kids, because we must teach kids curiosity. We must teach empathy. We must teach design thinking. We must teach coding. We must teach social scientists. Because we're in a society where 7.3 billion people, many of whom in developed markets are talking about disruption, but the one sector that has not been disrupted has been education. If Rup van Binkel had to wake up today, I promise you he'll say that everything's changed except education. Because we think education is about the preacher standing in front and pushing stuff down and you regurgitating it every June and every November in your final examination. And that's not how we should be teaching. We should be teaching the dreamers and the doers. We should be teaching people who are creative and innovative. When we teach solids, liquids, and gases, yes, we can say, come and repeat solid, liquid, and gas, but we can show it. We can show water and ice. We can smell it. We can feel it. We can touch it. We can taste it. And that's what we should start doing in our education sector. And so, as I was flying from uh, Harvard Business School last night where 
uh, Gibbs and Harvard run a senior exec program for 60 executives from across Africa. I walked with a heart full of hope and promise for this continent because the 60 people, I think, demonstrate phenomenal change. And I walked in today and I wasn't jet lagged because I met speakers who really demonstrate uh, the society that we want to live in. And so I'm going to be disruptive. And I apologize for that. I'm going to be disruptive with, with two minutes. And I'm going to read something that I wrote on the plane last night. Because it really speaks to my heart. And I want to end on it. And so I'm sorry that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of a piece of paper. I wrote this late on the plane yesterday. But I want to close with it. Because for me, my heart is filled with tension as I go back to South Africa. And let me close with this. It's Kwame Nkrumah who said that, I'm not an African because I was born in Africa, but because Africa was born in me. When Africa is born in you, you fall in love. In love with its special people, with their wisdom, with their care, with their respect. You fall in love with its food and its culture. You fall in love with its beautiful beaches, its great mountains, its rivers and its valleys. My beloved Africa, on this plane in reflecting on this love, I've come to realize that I love how you make me feel and the warmth with which you embrace me. I love that I have the privilege of being born a son of your soil. I love being showered with a kaleidoscope of showers at Victoria Falls. But I hate that 319 million people in sub-Saharan Africa are without access to reliable drinking water every single day. I love hearing the beat of my heart and feeling the flow of my blood as I connect eyeball to eyeball with a glorious elephant in Kenya. But I hate that Central Africa has lost 64% of its elephant population in the last 10 years. I love that we've been blessed with a landmass larger than the collective geography of India, China, Mexico, the USA, and most of Europe. But I hate that 220 million Africans are considered to be continually in a state of hunger. I love that you're home to the world's tallest and largest land animals, the giraffe and the African elephant. But I hate that we haven't been able to, cre to create the scale and the size that we need to drive sustainable and inclusive growth. My Africa, I love that we, the wealthiest continent under the ground, with the largest reserves of bauxite and cobalt and diamonds and phosphate and platinum group metals. But I hate that above the ground, our collective GDP per capita is less than 1,500 US dollars. I love that we have all the potential to light up most of our continent through potential opportunities such as the Grand Inga Dam in the DRC, and the Ashagoda wind farm in Ethiopia. But I hate that almost 575 million people in our continent live without electricity, which means that 80% of our people rely on energy sources such as wood and charcoal and dung in order to cook their food every day. I love how your wisdom taught me that it takes a village to raise a child. But I hate how sometimes we forget we forget this because 59 million children of primary school age are currently not in school. I love your proverb that says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. But I hate that some of our leaders have forgotten this for they have amassed wealth for themselves and forgotten our people. I love how you embrace different cultures and languages, 1,500 of them that color our continent but I hate the scars of centuries of oppression and colonialism whose shackles still haunt us every single day. I love how you have produced some of the finest food and some of the best fruit, maize, and grains in the world. But I hate that you still have people who can't find bread to fill their bellies so they can sleep at night. I love that you have some of the most talented and gifted women in the world. But I hate how you can't protect them and how 180,000 women on the continent still die from complications related to pregnancy and childbirth every single year. I love how excited and proud you make me feel when I teach cases on Dengote and MTN, 
and so many other phenomenal companies that were birthed from your bosom. But I hate that we haven't been able to produce a few more to address the crippling unemployment challenge. My Africa, I love how you've given me so much from an incredible childhood to the greatest experiences, to the best weather, to the privilege of hundreds of dialects and languages and cultures and people. I love that you've injected a special serum deep in my veins that I can't explain. I can't verbalize. I can't articulate. I can't rationalize, but I can feel because you're the home of Kwame Nkrumah, of Wangari Matai, of Julius Nyerere, of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, of Nelson Mandela, and of Patrice Lubumba. And as I reflect, I realize that I'm restless between these emotions of love and hate. But in this restlessness, and on the sprain, and the incredible beat of my heart, I have realized that I want to love you more because you're my Africa and the Africa of a billion other people. I have to be honest and realize that your scars are the consequences of years of brutality and a very difficult past based on colonialism and requires me to roll up my sleeves and do so much more because hate will get nobody nowhere but hard work and contextual appreciation of our past and the incredible opportunity of our future might just get us somewhere. Yes, we are in an era of disrup disruption. We have entered the fourth industrial revolution. My Africa, we won't sleep through it. For as Patrice Lumumba once said, one day Africa will write its own history and it will be a history of glory and dignity. And that history is now. Thank you.